Good morning. morning. Scripture this morning is 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time coming, the time is coming, when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, enduring suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. The word of the Lord. So let's go ahead and pray as we dig into God's word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. The psalmist tells us, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And we understand sin, Lord, that we're born into sin, if you will. Uh, we are born, but then you call us to be born again. And no one, no one will see you. No one will have a relationship with you apart from that. That, that sin separates us from you who is um, have a pure eyes and to be able to look upon sin. And in heaven, there won't be that, that sin, that the only people in heaven will be those who have trusted Christ as Lord and Savior. And so we thank you for the opportunity to tell people about it. Help us today as we dig into what preaching uh, is and what, what you tell us about that through the Apostle Paul's writing to Timothy, the, the pastor at the church at Ephesus. Help us to understand that we are to proclaim the good news and that it's urgent and um, that, that the result would be for us that we would call for an answer, yes or no, for people to trust Christ. But ultimately, it's up to your Holy Spirit. Just help us to be faithful. So help us to hear today and to, and to live out that word in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in part 11 of the Second Timothy series, the call to and the need of preaching. As we look at Second Timothy, it's all about the gospel. A lot of people think especially the gospel is just for getting saved, but the gospel, the good news, is in fact for living saved. How to become saved, how to live saved until God calls you home uh, is what the Salvation Army likes to call until you are promoted to glory. And... and um, in the meantime, how then shall we live? And so Paul is talking to Timothy, the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And for us at Lake Taps, this is a especially poignant book because it points us to an understanding of what kind of pastor we should be looking for as we start to set search criteria. As Brent has said, we're getting to the place where the transition team who has done things like uh, push the, for the new mission and for encourage us to have more elders and to, to help us evaluate where we are in our walk and in our history with the Lord, and to say, how then shall we live in terms of these recommendations? As they will be done, um, we think, I only got them to commit until the end of May, and uh, so I know they would stay with me longer if I needed them to, but I'm not going to be presumptive. And then we would hope, if our job is done, then we would start uh, putting together the pastoral search team and the search then. But who are we searching for? We're, we're searching for somebody who would preach the word and model that preaching for us. And so, spoiler alert in your outline today, we're going to talk first about the seriousness and the scope and the content of preaching. And that's actually going to take at least 80% of our time today. And then we'll talk about the urgency of preaching. Why, why is it urgent to do it now? And then we'll talk about, as Paul talks to Timothy, about what would be the fulfillment of that ministry. What does that look like? We can, we can go fishing, but we don't put the fish on the hook, if you will. And so as we look at that, we're going to see uh, number one is the first couple of verses in this passage. Uh, slide number one is going to say uh, in verses one and two, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and uh, by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. You know, we've seen as we looked at 2 Timothy that God's man is going to need to be, for lack of a better word, a perseverer. One of the things you'll look for in your pastor 
Is, has he persevered? Has he been faithful? We hear today that 70% of pastors do not stay in the ministry until they retire. Excuse me, I have it the other way around. Only at, at most 70% stay in the ministry until, until they retire. That means 30% 30, 30 of pastors leave for various reasons. Now, there could be health. There could be a lack of perseverance. There could be other issues. There could be moral failure. There could be teaching failure. But we know that a, a large amount of, of, of pastors drop out of the ministry. And so perseverance is going to be needed more and more. And we also know that towards the end times, as Paul has even um, put here, that there's going to be times when people will be less and less willing to hear the word of God. And so it's going to get more difficult. Chapter 2 in 2 Timothy lays out a number of patterns for perseverance. Paul gives Christ as the ultimate pattern for perseverance. He also gives himself in faithfulness as a pattern of perseverance. He gives a soldier. He gives an athlete, a farmer. He gives workmen, vessels, and servants. Now, and chapter 3 says then of 2 Timothy that there will be apostasy or false teaching falling away, even within the church. There will be wolves in sheep's clothing. And there are wolves that are intentional wolves. And there are wolves that are probably unintentional wolves, that they're deceived themselves. And they would call themselves a Christian, but they've never been born again. Or they would say they've been born again, but they're not following. You know, 1 John 2.19, it says of those people, it says, they departed from us because they were never part of us in the first place. Because it's, I believe that if a person is truly saved, they will stay saved. You know, if we could, if we could lose it, we would lose it. But in John 10, 28 and 29, Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who's given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. So what is that? There's going to be within the church, and certainly at Ephesus we saw within the church and also around the church, there were people that were putting pressure on Timothy. Timothy was not as strong at this point in the ministry as Paul. And, uh, and yet we, we understand that he persevered, but I, we think Paul was probably writing to him in the midst of some pretty bit difficult times where he might have been wavering. And so chapter 3 ends then about the work of God's man, and the, the point is the centrality of the word of God in that work. We talked about two terms. We talked about exegesis and exposition. Exegesis is digging out the meaning of the word. What did it mean in the context of the first audience to which it was written? What was the language? What are the sayings, the idioms in there, which we don't know? You know, we have all our own idioms. You know, just growing up, I had all these idioms from my dad that I'm just now starting to unpack, you know, more than one way to skin a cat. You know, when I was in junior high, my mom reminded me that it was inappropriate to skin a cat at all. Um, but there's more than one way to do it, okay? Uh, you can't get there from here? Well, how does anybody get there? Or my personal favorite I've shared with you before, it's not what you like that makes you fat. And I would tell my dad, it is exactly what I like that makes me fat. So we don't get those idioms, but unpacking the word of God becomes a thing that we need to know and we need to understand. And um, so that's an important thing. That's exegesis. And then there's exposition, which means what it looks like to expose that, if you will, that inerrant word into the context of how then will God's people live. So handling the word of God correctly, there needs to be the exegesis. There needs to be pulling out the meaning and there needs the exposition showing the meaning and saying, how then will we live? Uh, we saw in, in uh, our study of 2 Timothy so far, we saw a roadmap of, of the God's word teaching us, reproving, more, a little bit more on reproving later, uh, correction and training in righteousness, giving us the foundational doctrines, telling us when we are wrong, telling us how to get right, helping us to be discipled to the point where we are fully ready to do every good thing that God made us for and saved us to do. Now in chapter 4, we're at the part where Paul speaks of the call to preach and the need to preach. Now, this is, for elders, this is the job. This is the job description. And I know uh, elders and, and um, elder candidates, uh, you've been sitting on the bench in a lot of ways since I've been here. 
uh, because before I came, everybody was taking all kinds of turns but, but, uh, and standing here. But it's more than that because our elders are teaching and preaching, if you will, formally, maybe if they're leading a Bible study, informally, in conversation, formally again when they stand up here to talk to you for various and sundry reasons, like we did the Good Friday service, but also could be at the, at the meetings. But also, as much as this is to Timothy and all elders of the church, this scope and content of seriousness of preaching how to be right with God is for every believer. That God would use us to proclaim what is the truth of how to get right with God, but then day by day that God would use us to proclaim the truth of, hey, how am I living? Where are my thoughts? Where is my heart? Where is my action? Where is my use of my spiritual gifts within the local body of Christ and beyond? So that is for elders, but I also want us to understand that there is no more important undertaking that every Christian can do than to proclaim the good news of how to be saved, to it, that people would admit their sins, believe Jesus is the only way, and choose to repent of their sins and follow him and say, yes, I take me, Lord, I'm yours. But also how to, to live today, you know, when we see... Um, you know, somebody want to raise their hand and be a volunteer, I won't call you up here. I'll just kind of make fun of you. Is there anybody? Okay. So if you wanted to do that, if I saw you out there with your little breathing machine, but you had something else in the parking lot and you had the, the uh, coat hanger and you were breaking into a car that wasn't yours and hot wiring that car, I would say, sister, uh, that's, that's not good. <laughs> that we would be in each other's lives that we would hold one another accountable, that we would know the word of God in such a way that we are trustworthy to give and live the word of God. What's the most important thing that you can do in this life? To be used of God to help people change their minds. That's what metanoeo means. That's what the word repentance means. To change from facing yourself and your own desires as being your first, your, your list, your desire, to saying, I am going to follow Jesus. And for those of you who have followed Jesus and been saved, it's I'm going to follow Jesus today, April 7th. Later on today, April 7th at 2 p.m., I'm still going to follow Jesus. The most important thing we can do in life is to be used of God to give the word to help people to make that change, to make that repentance. When Rhonda and I pray um, in the mornings, we, one of the things we talk about, and we, we use that model, it's just... It just helps me to remember to try and do all the facets of prayer. We use that Acts model, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, sanctification. We get to, to confession. Not only do we say to God what we confess about our sins, but we say, God, help me to repent. Help me to turn from my sins today. Help me to agree with you about what sin is in my life and help me to turn from it and help me to turn and do what you want instead of what I am tempted to do. Well, now, when we get to 2 Timothy and Paul talking to Timothy, he's charging him. And for, no, this is not, he did not pull out a piece of plastic, okay? He's not charging him that way. He didn't write out a bill. There were bills that were written out in the first century. He didn't do that. This charge is a serious form of speech, okay? I want you to think about serious charges that you've heard. Maybe the speaker at a graduation or maybe an oath you took uh, if you became a naturalized citizen in this country or, or for any kind of thing in your work. Or maybe the employee contract that wasn't a, a verbal, audible charge, but it was something that was written out that says you will do this. Um, have you ever heard of a charge like the president gives a charge, the State of the Union? Or have you heard of the charge when somebody becomes a medical doctor and they take a Hippocratic oath? Or maybe you were in a wedding like your own wedding, and the pastor charged you, and you charged each other with your vows, and you responded with those. Many important things require a charge, and that's what Paul is saying here to Timothy as a pastor, lead pastor of Ephesus, as an elder, but also as a believer. I'm going to charge you about giving the word of God to call for a question. In, that, in one of my other favorite movies, and I've been teased a lot in the last week about my uh, quotes of movies, but uh, um, in, in one of my, my, uh, my favorite movies, in there, 
that has talked a lot about the oath that, that Marines take. And I had an assistant who was a Marine, and we talked about that oath that he had to take. There's a charge on how to live. And there's a, there's, in the Marines, there's, and I think other military branches, there's a code of honor, uh, the code of service, and, and all of those things. I want you to think about that you are charged. And we sing the song, I don't think we sing it very often, but the old Christian hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers. And Paul has used that example, example in 2 Timothy as a soldier, we don't get entangled in earthly affairs. What does that mean? That means that we place more value on things of eternal value than we do on things that when we go to be with Jesus, we won't ever care about anymore. That's what that charge has to do with. So Paul starts with this charge to Timothy. He only uses this word in all of his teaching uh, four times. It's dia martyromai. So you get the center word, martyr, okay? Same word is used for witness. It's witness through. It's a costly witness. It has to do with a witness that the costumes we talked about on Easter Sunday about all the, the different of the, of the 11 remaining um, and then the 12th one after Judas was removed um, of, of those guys and how they lived and how they died. But it's, it's that most severe charge. In other words, what he's saying, this is the most important thing you will ever do is tell people how to come to know Jesus and ask for a yes or no response and to tell people and encourage people that you would love to say, brother, sister, I want to win you. I don't want to win an argument. I want to win you. This is a thing I'm worried about. Like our sister there stealing the car in the parking lot. Okay, that's one, but, but don't do it anymore. Okay, but it's, it, I, I'm being facetious, but it's that same idea that we would care enough about it's not to put somebody down. It's to risk them being upset with us by telling them what we see from the word of God and that we, and that we love them enough. And also it carries implied with it that we would give them permission to talk to us if they thought that we needed to hear what they see in our lives about the word of God. And we know them very well or they know us very well. It will indeed happen. You know, we like to think that those things wouldn't happen, but it's not that, that there's not anything that happens that doesn't need to be correcting. It's just that sometimes we're too chicken or lack of loving enough to do it, to call, do what Paul talks about in the action sense of speaking the truth in love. So I want you to think about that. Um, if you saw one of these oaths or vows or charges before, um, it's like if there was a wedding and a group of friends and a family at the wedding, you know, that's, it's a solemn thing. Or it's like if you were in a courtroom and you raise your hand to say you'll give truthful testimony. Or it's like if the president is in front of Congress, the Supreme Court, and the country. We can make lots of examples, but we're not going to go there. Okay? For an advanced degree, it might be the whole group of professors who are hooding you, who are, have said that they have seen you, and uh, they've supported you. It's a solemn celebration, but it's also joyous too. Who's the audience in this charge? Paul says, the audience is God and Jesus Christ. So this charge towers above in solemnity and importance above any other charge. It has added serious and, and important, seriousness and importance. It says, Christ, God and Jesus Christ, quote, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. Now that's translated in the presence of God, even of Jesus Christ. If you turn with me to uh, John 5. 22. And it talks about this judgment. We as Christians don't like to, to use this. And in case you get a problem, you know, where you, you kind of blow a tire and you say, well, I'm not judging because the Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. That Matthew chapter 7 thing is talking about don't judge the intent of a person's heart because you're not the Holy Spirit. But we are supposed to be fruit inspectors. And Christ, here it tells us, is the judge. Okay, starting at verse 22 of chapter 5 of John. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. That means you, you've heard the voice. If you've become a Christian, you, you are spiritually dead, but the Holy Spirit made it possible for you to hear his voice and respond. Okay, and so, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. So there's three kinds of judgment, just so you know, when Jesus comes back, um, that's judgment time. But in the end, there's three kinds of judgment. Uh, one is the bema seat, or the reward of of, uh, of Christians' works. You can think about that if you've ever watched the Olympics, and I guess we'll be watching the Olympics, Lord willing, this summer, is when they stand on the podium and they get the medals. It's not, they don't bring up the person who finished last and chastise them. There's none of that. That would be an interesting Olympics, <laughs> Olympics, right? You know, the guy who falls the agony of defeat and all that. They don't do that. It's just the honors. That's the Bema seat is the honors. Okay, and even those we will cast at Christ's feet. Then there's the sheep and goats judgment, where Christians will be separated from non-Christians. And then there's the great white throne judgment, where non-Christians, those who did not trust Christ, get what they've earned in this life. It's not that God chooses to send people to hell, it's that they choose not to um, pick a way out, pick Christ as the only way. Also it says, his appearing, will be judged by his appearing. Paul uses that phrase five times. Uh, once, when uh, talking about Jesus becoming flesh, and all the others have to do uh, with his appearance when he returns. So Paul's charge is in light of what's in front and in light of what the final outcome will be. In other words, Paul's charge is this. In light of who Jesus is as the king of the universe, that it is one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Some will be into his everlasting glory and some will depart into everlasting consciousness or uh, everlasting conscious punishment in, in hell, if you will, torture. But it's in light of who Jesus is. And it's in light of that there is a time where there's no more chance to choose. Now we think of that as when a person dies, there's no more chance to choose. But the thing is, for the most part, we don't know when a person's going to die, Right? We don't know. You know, March 15th, I was driving down uh, out of the driveway of the good cells. I just said bye to Gordy. And if I'd have thought I was going to get hit on by a car, I would have said, oh, and by the way, thanks for being my landlord and being a great guy and my brother in Christ, and I'll see you in heaven. But I had no idea that somebody was going to cross the lane and hit me. And we don't have an idea, but the Father knows. And, and the idea is also that some people's hearts will get hard, I believe, and they will not trust Christ. So we don't know when that is coming. So we need to talk to them. And the same way goes for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are believers, but they might be getting into trouble like our, our sister here hot-wiring cars in the parking lot. And we don't know when that's going to turn into a habit and that's going to become a business and then, you know, all of those kind of things, right? So we don't know. But it's, 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 it's called for by God. And so that puts a tint on our understanding of the word preaching and proclaiming. Why? Because it makes us understand that this is not just about somebody getting up and talking or being in a classroom and talking or, or being in an, an office of elder and answering questions in the hallways and whatnot. It's not just somebody giving their opinion sprinkled with a few Bible verses to back it up and pack it up and make it nice and neat. It is so much more than that. And for you and I, brothers and sisters in Christ, it's so much more than that that we know the Word of God and we are being prepared to tell the Word of God. And when our, when our opinion comes out or we're, we're, giving, we're giving input on something, we're not just saying, well, I know there's no scripture about it, but I just feel that we should check the ground under us because we're on thin ice. It's important. Paul says it's important because when we're using the word of God, when we're telling people how to be saved or how to live saved, it needs to come from God's word. 
Because for us, there's a way that seems right to a man, and the ways thereof are the ways of death. The heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it, Scripture says. So, so this giving the word, God calls for gifts and enables it. This is not just an important charge or a serious charge. It's the most important and serious charge. And with all that in mind, then Paul says in verse 2, up here, preach the word, which again is the opposite of just having an opinion and using some scripture to back it up. It is dig down deep, exegete the word of God, and that should be a part of not just when I'm preparing for a sermon, but of my daily walk with God, and, and then prepare for when we're going to be giving it out. You know, it says, preach as caruso, herald, proclaim, sing it out, announce vigorously, give the message that calls for a yes or no response. Timothy's widely believed at this time, like I said a little bit earlier, to be a little more timid than Paul. Uh, he's receiving opposition from within and without the church. He's getting this opposition from within the church because people want control. They want to control. We want to control, if, even if it means controlling God. That's why churches, when they have a problem, they write so many locks and keys into their constitution and bylaws, because we want to prevent that from ever happening again. And then, of course, you can't from that, because if people didn't listen to the word of God, they're not going to listen to your constitution or bylaws. Right? And then we want, and we forget that that's not the only bad thing that's ever happened to Christians. There are other things. So what we want to do when we write things up is make sure as much as possible that they reflect the Word of God. And it's usually a lot more reflection than possible. We want to control. We want to protect ourselves from anything we don't like. Even we would protect ourselves from God Almighty. You know, Genesis 50, 20 says, even what man intends for evil, God intends for good. I don't know about you, but I don't like that. But I'm really glad it's there, that I can trust in the sovereign God. It's not that I go and, uh, and I'm just going to live by what, uh, what they used to call old pastors, and I'll be an old pastor here and call it uh, Doris Day theology. Have you ever heard of that, Doris Day? Probably nobody knows who Doris Day was, is. She's still alive, by the way, last I heard. She had a famous song, K Sarah Sarah. Like, whatever will be, will be. Uh, that was called, long before Doris made the scene, that was called fatalism, okay? And so we don't have a fatalistic theology, but we say we do what God calls us to do, and we trust him for what we cannot do. And so we don't have to try to control everything. This passage here basically gives the, change church, the charge that churches have been giving elders and pastors throughout history for the last 2,000 years. You've been put here, pastor, elder, and accepted here and foremost for the reason to proclaim God's word. And for those 30% of pastors that flee the ministry, I will, or elders that flee the ministry, I'll tell you it's, it's doubly sad for them because if God has called them and enabled them, it's like I used this example before of when I was a kid and I didn't have a baseball bat using my mom's carpet sweeper as a baseball bat. You know, Pastor Elder, you've been called and enabled to do something, and you're like hitting the ball with a baseball bat or with a, with a carpet sweeper. It's not good for the carpet sweeper, and the ball doesn't go very far. And so that is something to remember. If we're, and also, if we're not capable, then we need to ask God to help us with that. We might not be called to be an elder, a pastor, but we are certainly called to what Timothy will say, what Paul will say to Timothy later is to do the work, fulfill the ministry. But the job is to proclaim the word. And by word, Paul means the entire written word of God. This goes on more to what we said about exegesis and exposition. Um, and I was talking to somebody even about this this morning. Um, you know, you can preach topically, you don't have to preach verse by verse through the word, but it's harder to preach topically and be true to the word of God. You have to work extra hard, at least I know I do, when I'm going to talk about a topic as opposed to preaching through verse by verse because I've got to make sure that I give the, give the context for the verses that I use, that I, that I get it right, and I'm not just cherry-picking, I'm not just adding on verses to my case. We can certainly preach topically 
Um, but it is, it is especially extra challenging, even for the most experienced leader. And then Paul says, be ready in season and out of season. Ready is prepared for a sudden need that we would jump, be willing to jump to the occasion. The idea is to be able to give the word now and be willing to do so. Willing means it can be earnest in sincerity. Paul uh, Spurgeon said the most important characteristic of the man of God is that he's earnest. Not wanting to win an argument, but wanting to win a soul. That's so hard. I don't know how you were raised. When I was a kid and, and my brothers, and I think of one in particular who's been real helpful to me, who, is, who are attorneys, I will tell you this, that they, they, they got a bad rap in this is when I was a kid and I loved to argue, my, my family and a large extended family, they would always say, you should be a lawyer because you love to argue. Okay, I think there's a little more to it than that, a lot more to it than that. But you know, some of us are raised just loving to argue. The point is not to win an argument. The point is to win somebody to God's way of thinking. How do we know what God's way of thinking is? It's consistent with God's word. So in season and out of season men means when it's convenient and when it's not convenient. And then there's the, the, uh, the little Lawrence Welk thing here. Again, you probably don't know who Lawrence Welk was, but I played the accordion when I was a kid, so I do. Um, but Lawrence Welk was famous for saying and a one and a two and a three. So there's a one, two, three here. And he says, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Those are the things that a man of God needs to be ready to do. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Now, reprove is, is a word for dealing with the sin itself, to expose a wrong, to bring to light something that is opposite of God's word and God's character. It means to show that there's an error, that there's a wrong turn, that the error bearer, if you will, is in a ditch. Okay, it shows that we, there's misbehavior, false doctrine. So reprove is basically to prove that that thing is in contradiction to the word of God. Rebuke has to do with a person, the error bearer, if you will. Okay, that sinner, to bring that person to repentance. And that's not all on man itself. Man is supposed to be faithful in that. But ultimately, we depend on the Holy Spirit because we don't argue anybody to repentance. We make God's case from God's word, but we have to trust God's spirit. And then we trust that the person would be like this in 2 Timothy 2, 24, where it says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. So this is somebody who is practiced at using the word of God to point people towards being right with God. There is no more urgent or important or timely calling that they would come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do as well. That's the thing, is if a person hasn't accepted Christ, they are in a sense under the prince of the power of the, of, of the air at this time. And so we're praying that God would use us in their lives to turn them around, to face him. But also for a brother or sister in Christ who is hot wiring cars in the parking lot or whatever they might be doing, that's, that's a sinful practice to come alongside them and say, I love you too much. If you, if you need to hit me, that's fine. If you need to be upset with me, then fine. But I, I want, I, I, this is what the word of God says. This is what I see in your life. Can we pray about it? Can we talk about it? I would like to be a help to you. It's not that I am better than you. You know, it's, it's one spiritual beggar telling another spiritual beggar how to Take in the bread of life, who is Jesus, how to live with him. And so MacArthur says a good way of looking at this is when he comments that reproof has to do with um, exposing the sinfulness of sin, and rebuke has to do with dealing with the sinfulness of the sinner. And then the three from the one, the two, and the three is exhort. To exhort, to encourage. The word here is parakaleo, from which we get the word comforter or Holy Spirit. 
And God would use us to come alongside to encourage, strengthen, comfort, even beg to come around to what God says, to lovingly encourage them to biblical change without, with complete patience and teaching. Patience means that we endure with them. Patience means that they might get upset with us. Patience means that they might sometimes not want to speak to us for a while. How do we know that? Because sometimes we're like that, if somebody were to bring things up to us. But if we don't do that for each other, who will? If you look with me to Romans uh, chapter 2, verse 3. And I told you, I know the slide, it's still supposed to be up there, so no worries, okay? But Romans chapter 2, verse 3. Do you suppose, O man, who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? What this means is, are you just going to think badly of them and not help them? Are you going to say, oh, you idiot, you're in a ditch, and not stop to help get them out of the ditch? It says, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And so that's what God wants us to do for each other, and especially our leaders, our elders to do for us. And with it comes teaching, like we talked about before in 2 Timothy, all the way back to 2 Timothy now, chapter 3, from last time we were in Timothy. I was going to say last week, but the last two weeks were Palm Sunday and and Easter. So 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And you probably memorized this, but just in case, it says, all scripture is breathed out by God. There's only two places that I know of in the Word of God where it talks about life being breathed out by God. One is in Genesis with the creation of man. And the other one is here. It has to do with Scripture. It's a, is the living Word of God. All Scripture is breathed out by God. That's the word that you get inspired from. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof. What's the difference between reproof and rebuke again? Reproof is pointing out that something is a sin. Okay? For correction, that's rebuke, if you will. And for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for, very good, for every good work. In other words, if we aren't doing this in our lives and we aren't doing this with each other, then we are not thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is what the word of God is for, to interact with the church, with the local church, from our leaders to us and then us to each other, from the elders to us and us to each other, to, to give that urgent case that here is what God is calling us to do. And so that we would be equipped for good work. That's what the biblical elder is to do, but it must be done with love. That's easy to say. It's hard to do, but the reminder is we're not trying to win an argument. We're trying to win a brother. And with, we're trying to win people to Christ, and with Christians, we're trying to win our brother to obedience in Christ. We know Matthew 18, 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. The word gain here, cardano, means to win him over, to gain one to following Jesus. And, and notice in Matthew 18, that's a Christian to a Christian, to gain a brother. So they don't go farther down that slippery path. You know, I am... I, um, I've, I really love the weather here. I, I gripe a little bit when the hail is blowing sideways. But, but other than that, it's, it's, it's great, I think. And, you know, and, I, and, and now, especially within the next 30 days, we'll probably have our first 100-degree day in Fresno, at which case I will indeed rise up and call the weather here blessed. Okay? But I was, um, a couple months ago, I went out in, uh, on my patio there at night to go throw some garbage away up the, up the driveway. And as I was going out, I heard a crunch, crunch. This should have been my first sign that things are not as Bob is used to, okay? But I heard the crunch, crunch, and I went to go out the, up the driveway, and I noticed that as I stepped up, I was actually going down, and I thought, well, this is not good. And so I just pivoted as quickly as a 16, 68-year-old man 
can pivot and turn around. And on my way now, gliding down the driveway, I grabbed a pole. <laughs> and I did not fall down. All good stuff. Your elders are your poles. You and I are each other's poles with the word of God in, in our lives. And if there's no pole put out there, we're going to fall down and it's not going to feel bueno. And we can slide and hurt and we can, and believe me, if I'm sliding down the hill, I'm taking other people with me. And we don't want to do that. God has made us for better things. What's the most important thing you can do in life to be used of God to help people to change their minds from their way to God's way, from not being saved to being saved, from living as a worldly person who is saved to living as a godly person who is saved. Now, at all this point, we go to number two. These are much, um, much quicker, or else we would cut into the lunch with Micah today. The urgency of preaching, verses three and four. It says of 2 Timothy chapter 4, 3 and 4, it says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate in themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Well, I don't know if Paul was saying the time is coming or that he could see it on the horizon, but I'm here to tell you the time is here. The time is here. And, and we, what would be the worst thing that could happen? I was, I was thinking back, I get those reminders on social media about what happened three and four and five years ago, and now as we're four years out from when the COVID thing hit, I thought, what would be the worst thing that could happen with COVID? And I think the worst thing would be that people would not come to rely on Jesus. They would go through this, whatever it was, you want to label it or call it, and they would not have grabbed onto Jesus. And the second worst thing would be that Christian people did not come to rely on Jesus. With, and, and so if people make it through these cataclysmic times without falling on our knees to embrace Jesus, will we be hardened in our self-satisfaction and a false sense of security? That would be a disaster. There'll be times of difficulty, more than that, that we've read about in this book. Every era, especially between when Christ came the first time and when he comes back the second time. And the, and the thing is, will we be hardened or not? If we don't practice softening, we'll be hardened. If we don't practice giving the truth, people will be hardened. If we don't practice receiving the truth, we will be hardened. It's urgent. It's urgent. They is not just the world. They can be us, especially in the, in the Ephesian church with Timothy. And this is the thing, is you're looking for a new pastor, you're going to look for somebody who's dealt with real life and not just pretended. I would ask him, have you ever had to deal with church discipline in your church? Because a guy who's been at a church for a long time and there's been no church discipline, it doesn't mean that everybody was behaving well and perfectly, and scripturally, it means that there were tough problems that people decided not to deal with. That's what it means. And so then you would ask him, well, okay, what did you do? And people will embrace false teachers. You know, I, um, Matt preached a long time ago, and I was watching online, and he talked about a false teacher. And I'm not going to mention that guy today or give him credit or debit or whatever, but the guy he mentioned was indeed a false teacher, and he's got thousands of people at his church, and he's teaching heresy today. And yet, a Christian, a Christian teacher can get whacked for even making a reference to him. So it means knowing and telling people the truth about not only what God says about their sin, but about our sinfulness. Our sinfulness. Sins are like rats. If you see a rat in a garage... Does it mean that there's just one rat in your garage? I read from an exterminator one time, says the odds are if you've got a pretty good garage and it's pretty full and you see one rat, there's at least 26 rats. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> or, or squeamish men like me. So let's deal with the rat we see. 
And let's do it urgently because there will be more that we don't see. Paul talks in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 about how people's hearts get hardened and how they aren't listening. He says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's what we're presenting, the glory of Christ to the body of Christ and the body of Christ to the world to tell them about Jesus. That's why it says in Hebrews 13, but exhort one another every day as long as it's called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. If we're not exhorting, if we're not encouraging one another, then there is hardening happening. In 2 Corinthians 6, 2, he says, for in a favorable time I listened to you, and, and this is a quote from Isaiah 40 also, by the way, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. If you're here today and you've not accepted Christ, but you're thinking, yeah, I, 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 today's the day. You might not feel like it tomorrow. Your heart might not ever be softer than it is today. So say to God right where you're at. You can say it silently, and your eyes can be opened, by the way. And you can say it silently, Lord, I agree with you that I have sinned. There's at least 26 other rats rolling around. I believe that, Jesus, you are the only way that I can have fellowship with God. I choose you this day to be my Lord and Savior. I repent. I turn from my way of doing things, my sins, and I say, yes, Lord Jesus, take my life. If you have done that, tell other people. God needs to get the credit, and you need to get the encouragement. But for those of us who are dealing with the day in and day out of rats, it means we don't have to wait till somebody points out our sin to us. We can ask for help with our sin. But you have great leaders here, and you're getting a whole bunch more. Avail yourself of them. And leaders, you're called to do a job. It's an urgent job to give the gospel and also to give people the word of how to live the gospel formally, like up here and in other places in the church and in Bible studies, but also informally, on the fly, as we go by. And so what's the most important thing you can do in life to be used of God to help people change their minds from their way to God's way? And then lastly, number three, that we would fulfill the goal of preaching. He says to Timothy, As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Do it. Do it now. What do you need to carry out your calling? It says be sober. What that means is don't be influenced or flavored by the world's thinking, what it has to offer, what men seek after, or their ways. Endure hardship. One of my favorite phrases in Scripture Kaka patheo. That's Greek. Okay, so if it sounds like something to you, please don't get upset with me. But um, it, it means, you know, what it sounds like it means. It means put up with stuff. Okay, put up with cruddy situations, both by your situation, by people. Put up within the case of that you are going to love them and you're going to tell them the truth, even though they're kind of hard to take. And people will see that the gospel is real. When Jesus crucified, was crucified, the disciples scattered to save their lives. But when he was resurrected, and they, said, they, they changed. And they said, I saw the resurrection, and now it's okay if I die, because I know that Jesus is going to resurrect me too, and that my life would be important, because I've been used for what he made me and saved me to be used for. 2 Timothy 3.12, it says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And then he says to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. There's a pretty good chance that Timothy might not have had the title evangelist, and he might not have had actually the, the spiritual gift of evangelism. But every Christian is called to evangelize, to give good news. And so he's saying, do that. God will bless you. You may not have, you know, people are going to look at you and say, you're gifted. You're a gifted evangelist, Timothy. But do, do the work. Evangelists only used a few times, but the action part of that word is you score of times in the New Testament. In other words, the gift of evangelism is only used a few times, but the fact that every Christian is to evangelize is used throughout. 
the New Testament, the action part. It might not be your gifting. It might not be your office. But it is the ministry of primary service of every Christian. And, and elders, fellow elders, and fellow future elders, we've got to lead the way in this. We've got to be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks us to give the reason for the hope. So it is urgent. It is a fulfillment of our ministry. And, and that we would do this in, for God, for that we would fulfill, that we would, that we would do the thing for which we were purposed here. And we are to continue to do it until he calls us home. Well, you know, for some reasons, when, when people think of giving the good news or of sharing with a brother or sister in Christ about things that have to do with, with the gospel or even things that we, we have a strong opinion but it has no connection to the word of God whatsoever, but we just feel this way, we get a little hard. We don't want to look at the word of God when we are feeling contrary to the word of God. So maybe we need to come along to a brother. Or maybe it's good that we are taking communion because we can proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We can know that we have, not only are we going to resurrect, but the fact that we were saved as a demonstration of the resurrection power because we could not even want Christ on our own. We could not be even interested in the word of God on our own without the prompting of the Holy Spirit. So it would be a shame to waste that prompting without talking to God. So let's spend some time and talk to him right now. And, and, and if you don't feel a prompting today, it would also be a shame to persist in that state. So you could say, like somebody prayed this morning during our prayer time, I believe, help my unbelief. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word and we come to your table, we thank you that you are faithful that you don't deny yourself, that you don't deny those who you've saved. So we thank you that we can boldly come to you. And we ask, Lord, that, that help us to repent of the things we need to repent of and help us to love one another enough to speak the truth and love to each other as well. Not that we would get our way, but that your way would be accomplished. Not that, that we would feel self-satisfied but that that person would be delighting in you and we would be delighting in you with them. Lord, we ask that you help us to cause you delight. So as we come to the table here, we, we thank you. We ask, Lord, just as we take a little time of silence, please show us things that we need to repent of. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You are sent.